Welcome. We've got, I'm here with some of the educators from the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum. I've got Eric and Ford, Melissa, and Ashley. So um, Ford and Eric are going to talk to you some about the World War II content and take you around our museum. And Melissa and Ashley are going to be working behind the scenes to check and see if you guys have questions as we go along. So thanks so much to your teacher, Ms. Francie, for getting in touch with us and letting us come to Texas today. Okay, so I'm gonna turn off some people here and get started. All right, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna start with a virtual tour of our museum. So uh, we're gonna go to Eric and Eric's gonna take you for a walk around the museum. Hope you enjoy. Okay. All right, so uh, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna go on a virtual tour of the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum. And uh, just gonna get that set up. And here we are, all right. So, um, just as I mentioned, gonna start with a virtual tour of the museum. And uh, first off, just wanna welcome everybody to the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum online. Uh, the museum is located in three World War II buildings on Ford Island in the middle of Pearl Harbor and is America's first aviation battlefield. Right here is where World War II began for the United States. It was outside this hangar and on these grounds. This is a picture of Hangar 37, the main hangar of the museum, uh, which was taken on December 7, 1941, the day of the attack. And in the surrounding waters, high-level bombers, dive bombers, torpedo bombers, and fighters from the Imperial Japanese Navy mounted their attack on that peaceful December morning in 1941. And if you look closely at this picture here, this was taken by one of the Japanese aircraft up in the skies that morning. And where my cursor is right now, you can see one of the attacking aircraft after it released one of its bombs or torpedoes that morning. The Japanese launched two attack waves on December 7th, each consisting of more than 150 aircraft that morning. Uh, this map that you see, it traces the path of both attacks. The red path follows the first wave of 183 aircraft that began attacking at 7.55 a.m. that morning. They targeted airfields at Wheeler, Eva, Kaneohe, Bellows, or Kaneohe, Hickam, Ford Island, and the ships that were anchored at Pearl Harbor. Depicted in beige over on this side, the second wave of 171 aircraft arrived about an hour later and attacked airfields at Wheeler once again, Kaneohe once again, Bellows, Hickam, and once again came to Pearl Harbor. The attacking force left death and destruction in their wake. Uh, the first bombs that fell crippled the American air defenses and decimated the fleet. The U.S. was stunned and unprepared for this attack. It was a dark day for the entire country Yet out of the ashes of this defeat, the U.S. and her allies fought back to claim a victory that changed the world. Now, as you enter the main gallery of Hangar 37, we see three types of aircraft that made it possible for the Japanese to mount their offensives. The first in this painting by Drew Blair is an Aichi D-3A Val dive bomber right here in the corner. Following that is the light and agile Mitsubishi A6M Zero fighter. And following that is the Nakajima B5N Kate bomber. Kate bombers were instrumental in destroying Battleship Row, and it was a Kate that delivered the bomb that sunk the USS Arizona on that morning. While our Zero and Kate did not fly over Pearl Harbor, they represent the aircraft that filled the skies on that December morning. The Kate that you see here uh, is extremely rare. Of the 1,149 built during the war, it is the only one on display in the United States. And suspended over the gallery is a model of the U.S. Army's P-40 Warhawk Pursuit Fighter. This plane represents those flown by Ken Taylor and George Welsh 
two American flyers whose quick actions downed some of the enemy aircraft. Civilian pilots were in there that morning too, unaware that their pleasure flights would soon turn into a race for their lives. This Aranka carried a father and son to safety after taking fire from one of the Japanese attackers. Part of the, the December 7th story involves the little known account of a zero that crash landed on the island of Nihau after the young Japanese pilot found his target on Oahu. Not knowing what was happening on Oahu, the islanders initially welcomed the pilot, but ultimately his life ended tragically. As the US began to fight in the Pacific, the story of the Tokyo Raid, better known as the Doolittle Raid, rallied the entire country. This creative and risky venture in April of 1942 showed the adversary that the U.S. was not afraid to fight back. Our exhibit features the B-25 Mitchell bomber, specially fitted for carrier operations in this top secret mission. Continuing the tour, we come to the SBD Dauntless dive bomber and scout plane. This aircraft was a standout in the Battle of Midway in June of 1942 and helped define a new era of warfare, one where air power dominates the battlefields. As the war continued into the fall of 1942, U.S. Marines fought in their Grumman F-4F Wildcats on an island in the South Pacific known as Guadalcanal. The Marines fighting in the skies did their best to support the Marines fighting on the ground as they fought off daily enemy airstrikes and ground attacks. The yellow Stearman Cadet biplane has the distinction of being the primary World War II trainer for the U.S. Army Air Corps and the U.S. Navy. While undergoing flight training in 1942, George Herbert Walker Bush, the 41st President of the United States, flew this very airplane. As we conclude the tour of Hangar 37, we exit the front doors and notice the operations building and water tower across from the entrance. The building was new in 1941 and served as a fire station, control tower, administrative offices for the air station. The aerological cab on top of the building, right here, this lower white tower, it provided a 360 degree view of the attack on Pearl Harbor. A short walk from the main hangar takes us to Hangar 79, which houses some iconic World War II warbirds, as well as a lineup of aircraft that represents the evolution of aviation in the post-war era. Before entering the hangar, we look up at the bullet damaged windows, remnants of the Pearl Harbor attack. Once inside, we head toward the rear of the hangar to visit our C-47, the fabled military transport and cargo aircraft of World War II. These rugged planes, known as Goonie Birds, were so versatile and reliable that they saw service with almost every allied nation during the war. To the right of the Goonie Bird is the renowned B-17 Swamp Ghost, the, the type of bomber that flew from the U.S. mainland into the chaos of December 7, 1941. This particular aircraft flew through Hawaii on December 17, 1941, and then onward to the South Pacific. It crashed in Papua New Guinea after its mission in February 1942. Her crew survived but the plane languished in a swamp for 60 years before co finally coming home to Oahu and to our museum. The Swamp Ghost has a distinctive logo known as Nose Art. The Walt Disney Company designed this logo for the Swamp Ghost to honor her crew and her story. The Swamp Ghost and the C-47 Goonie Bird reside in Lieutenant Ted Sheely's restoration shop. It's an active aircraft repair facility. Our experts preserve the tools and techniques of warbird maintenance, giving new looks and new life to these vintage aircraft. As we conclude our tour, we encourage you to imagine the events that happened here on that fateful day in 1941. Consider the impact of this attack on not only Hawaii and the US, but across the world. Honor the memory of those who made the greatest sacrifice to secure our freedoms and remember Pearl Harbor. And Thank you so much, Eric, for sharing um, the our museum with these fifth graders. So we usually start our field trips with a tour just like the one that Eric gave you, but we definitely miss the personal connection that
some of the comments that you're making in the chat on the side. So please keep um, asking any questions in our chat box and we'll try to answer some of those uh, as at the end of the presentations. So then um, your teacher, Ms. Francie, when she first contacted us, she said that you guys were learning about the Great Depression and you had just finished that and you were starting to learn about World War II. Okay. So she asked if we would uh, kind of go over some of the highlights and the who, what, where, when, and why things happened in World War II. And so we have Ford here and he's gonna share some of those answers to your teacher's um, questions. So. For the rest of you guys, two students, keep on um, adding your questions to the chat box and um, we're going to pass it over to Ford. All right. Aloha everyone in Pilot Point, Texas. Again, my name is Ford Abyssal and I'm an educator with the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum here in Hawaii. And I have the pleasure of working with all of you in discussing America's involvement in World War II. And this is gonna be in the Pacific. Before the attack on Pearl Harbor, the world was already at war. September 1st, 1939, Germany invaded the country of Poland. Germany had earlier taken over country, the countries of Austria and Czechoslovakia. However, the attack on Poland was the breaking point. The British and French declared war on Germany. And that was the beginning of the Second World War, which would soon spread around the globe. The United States was on the same side as Britain and France. They, we were the allies, but many Americans wanted to stay out of the war in Europe. Instead, President Roosevelt supported the allies by providing money and supplies to help them in their fight against Germany and Italy. There were key people involved in World War II. Franklin D. Roosevelt was our president at the time for the United States. Winston Churchill was the prime minister of England and the United Kingdom. Joseph Stalin was the, the premier of the Soviet Union. And again, we were called the Al. The Axis were led by Chancellor Adolf, Prime Minister Hideki Tojo of Japan, and Benito Mussolini, Prime Minister. Nine as the start of World War II with Germany invading Poland. In fact, earlier events helped set the stage for war when Japan invaded China in 1937. Over time, the Japanese treatment of the Chinese people grew worse and worse. They committed terrible acts against the Chinese including killing hundreds of thousands of its people. That would be equivalent to the population of Pilot Point today times 50. The United States became very disappointed with Japan's invasion of China and their occupation of other countries in the Pacific. U.S did not want to send soldiers to try and stop Japan. Instead, America stopped selling the Japanese certain goods 
including steel, iron, and most importantly, oil, the lifeblood of the Japanese war machine. The Japanese, however, did not change their minds. Instead, they stood firm, continuing their conquest of Asia. Here you can see a cartoon from a newspaper showing Uncle Sam cutting off the oil supply to Japan, which runs their war machine. Japan thought the trade embargo by the United States was unfair and considered it to be an act of war. They believed that if they could attack and destroy the U.S. Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor, they could force America to sue for peace rather than fight a war with Japan. So on December 7, 1941, at 7.55 in the morning, Japan launched an attack on Pearl Harbor and neighboring airfields with over 350 aircraft. Pearl Harbor was not prepared for an attack. It was left mostly unguarded. Most of the U.S. Pacific Fleet was there on that fateful December morning. Over 2,400 men, women, and children were killed in that attack. Our hangar, 37, witnessed this attack and is but a few hundred yards away from where the first bomb was dropped in that attack and which drew the United States into World War II. On December 8th, the day after the attack, President Roosevelt declared war on Japan. Three days later, Germany declared war on the United States. The U.S. began sending troops overseas both in Europe and the Pacific turning the tide of war in favor of the Allies. On February 19, 1942, President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066. Under the terms of this order, some 120,000 people of Japanese descent living in the United States were removed from their homes and placed in internment camps. The U.S. government justified this action by claiming that there was a danger of those of Japanese descent spying for the enemy. More than two-thirds of those interned, 112,000, were American citizens and half of them were children. None had ever shown any disloyalty to the U.S. During the entire war, only 10 people were convicted of spying for Japan, and none of those were of Japanese descent. On April 18, 1942, the United States undertook a very daring and top secret mission. This dangerous mission, which had never been done before, required 16 army bombers and 80 air crew to take off from a Navy aircraft carrier to attack the heart of Japan itself, Tokyo. These army bombers struck five locations in Japan. This attack, known as the Doolittle Raid, in honor of its leader, Lieutenant Colonel James Doolittle, raised the morale of the American people, who were so desperately needed, their spirits lifted, following the devastating attack on Pearl Harbor just four months earlier. Just two months later, on June 4th, 
the United States Navy was able to ambush the Imperial Japanese Navy near the islands of Midway, about a thousand miles northwest of Hawaii. With only three American aircraft carriers, we were able to sink four Japanese carriers that were used in the attack on Pearl Harbor. The Japanese were never able to recover from this loss, and it's considered the turning point in the Pacific War. This is where we went from defense to the offense, taking the war directly to the Japanese. The goal of the island hopping strategy used by the United States during World War II was to gain control of Japanese held islands in order to set up our own military bases. The U.S. went from island to island, defeating the Japanese in order to set up airstrips and military bases. Slowly but surely, the U.S. military kept moving closer and closer to mainland Japan. Our intent was to island hop all the way across the Pacific to eventually launch an invasion of Japan itself. A B-29 bomber, Enola Gay, dropped the first atomic bomb on the Japanese city of Hiroshima on August 6, 1945. The city was utterly destroyed claiming the lives of over 80,000 people. Three days later, a second bomber, Boxcar, dropped a second atom bomb on the city of Nagasaki, killing 40,000 more. Japan surrendered unconditionally on August 15th. On September 2nd, 1945, aboard the U.S. battleship Missouri in Tokyo Bay, a Japanese delegation formally signed the documents of surrender, officially ending World War II. On behalf of all of us at the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum, I'd like to thank all of you for allowing us to come and spend this time with you. We'll try to answer as many of the questions you sent us. Have a wonderful day, stay healthy, and aloha. All right, thank you so much, Ford, for telling us so much about World War II and then also for uh, sharing uh, that con all of those topics in such a short time. I, the kids have a lot of questions that they've asked, and so we're gonna go ahead and get started with some of those questions. I'm gonna wait a minute till Ford, can you? Uh, I'm having problems. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, let's get to a couple of questions that were sent to us. Let's go ahead and do that. I'll start with how about um, Brooklyn's question? All so right. Yeah. Brooklyn asked. What was her question? Brooklyn asked, why did the Japanese attack Pearl Harbor in the first place? Well, I, I think I kind of mentioned that briefly in, in my presentation, but in the late 1930s, Japan was a very aggressive country. Because they lacked many natural resources, they felt the need to take it from other countries in the Pacific. You recall what they did to China, right? Well, prior to all this, America was selling Japan most of its steel and oil. The United States put an embargo on these goods as a protest to the Japanese for what they were doing in Asia. And because of this, among other things, Japan felt its only recourse was to attack Pearl Harbor and hoped that America would rather settle for peace rather than go to war. 
I hope that answers your question, Brooklyn. All right, I think that also while we had the presentation, Bailey had asked a similar question. So I think that was definitely one that they had in mind. And I think that there was so much content that co was covered that it's, it's totally okay to ask a question that even if it was covered in the presentation. All right, so we have another great question. Actually, two came from Victoria before, the, um, before we came into the classroom today. So Victoria asked, why do you think the US maintained a position of neutrality in World War II for so long? Uh, <laughs> that is an awesome question, Victoria. Um, America's neutrality uh, actually was based on our experience from World War I, over 20 years prior to, to the attack. And many Americans could still recall the horrors of that European war. And many of them did not want to get drawn into another one. And they felt it was a European problem and it did not concern the United States. And that's why there were so many people that wanted to remain neutral and not get involved. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to uh, go in on that as well. Um, another reason why they kind of maintain neutrality was something that the U.S. did previously in many international conflicts. And um, reading the chat while Ford was talking, I noticed one of your classmates said that they were 30% German. Uh, you probably have classmates that are part British, Italian, uh, possibly Japanese, Chinese, things like that. Um, so if you entered a war where all these countries were fighting each other, how would you handle that at home as well with all these different peoples together um, that could cause some problems at home as well. So that may be another reason why uh, the U.S. stayed neutral in the early parts of the war. All right, Victoria, I hope that answered your question. So we have another, we have a question from Hunter. So Hunter asked, what impact did the, att the attack on Pearl Harbor have on World War II? Want to take that one forward? Okay, I'll take that one. Uh, well, Hunter, um, the main thing that uh, brought the United States into the war, both in Europe and the Pacific, you know, we were initially, um, we were just supporting the war with arms and supplies, but after the attack on Pearl Harbor, we could now send millions of troops to help that fight that war. And it galvanized the American people. In other words, it brought us together as one country with a common foe. It, it's similar to what we're experiencing now with this pandemic, how um, the foe would be that pandemic and how the United States and everybody in this world has kind of come together to help each other. I have some more questions that are related to that same topic, Ford, or Eric also, is uh, Trinity was asking um, about how many people died in the plane crashes on Pearl Harbor, and Ms. Francie had asked how many died in total in the attack on Pearl Harbor. Could you answer that one for us? Um, well, Sorry about that. Well, actually, uh, the total number of people that were killed in the attack was 2,403. That was the total number of those that, that gave their lives on that December 7th morning. And that includes um, sailors, Marines, uh, soldiers, and women and children were part of that, that, that number. There were also 1,178 wounded in the attack. One question Ms. Francie had asked, had school started for that day yet? Um, luckily, it was a Sunday morning, so school was out. Um, I, I would hate to have thought had they attacked on a weekday and schools were in session and kids were about, 
how much more of a, a, a tragedy it could have become. But luckily, um, school was not in session on that Sunday morning. Now, we've talked quite a bit about the, how many people died in the attack on Pearl Harbor, um, but Bailey was asking what the cost of the attack on Pearl Harbor was and what the significance of the USS Arizona. Well, um, the cost wise, and I'm not talking about monetary costs, but what we lost during the attack um, were 19 ships. 19 ships were damaged or, or destroyed. As far as aircraft, um, over 350 American aircraft were damaged or destroyed on that December 7th morning. And um, the significance of the Arizona and why we have the Arizona Memorial and why we have over a million people visiting the Arizona, Arizona Memorial every year is because of what happened to the ship on that December 7th morning. Um, a huge Japanese bomb struck the Arizona and that bomb penetrated into the Arizona deck. And where that bomb exploded was in the gunpowder storage room of, that, of the Arizona. And that bomb ignited over a million pounds of gunpowder, which created a huge explosion that took the lives of 1,177 sailors and marines. It is the greatest single loss of life on a U.S. Navy warship in the U.S. Navy history. And that's what makes it so tragic. And there are still over 900 sailors and Marines still aboard the Arizona. And that's why the memorial was erected. And that's why the Arizona is such a significant factor in the attack on Pearl Harbor. So a related question to that was, um, of the battleships that were attacked in Pearl Harbor, how many of those have been restored? That's an excellent question. Um, Eric? Um, yeah, I'll take this one. Of, of the 19 ships that were sunk or severely damaged that day, um, all but three of them went back into service and fought in the war. Um, of course, the Arizona, uh, stayed there and is the memorial monument today. Uh, the USS Utah is still in the harbor today as well on the other side of Fort Island. And the USS Oklahoma um, was not lifted from the bottom either until later after the war was over. I believe it was in 1947 uh, when that ship was finally uh, lifted from the bottom of the harbor and was being towed towards California when it eventually sunk out in the deep ocean. Yeah, so only three of the ships uh, were not repaired and sent back to work. Thanks, Eric. Um, some of the students are asking a little bit more information about the um, Japanese role in the war. And Bailey was asking, why did the Japanese do what they did? And I, I think um, that question came around the time that Ford, you were talking about um, the Japanese entering the war. And so I think it, it was referencing, um, why did the Japanese invade other countries? <laughs> And as I mentioned earlier, um, Japanese is an island, and it's a very tiny island, actually, and um, they lack the natural resources. And for a country like Japan that had ambitions to control Asia, and they needed a strong war machine, they had to obtain these natural resources from other places. And that would be the neighboring countries that did have these natural resources that Japan could use for their uh, domination of Asia. And that's why China was, was invaded. And that's why the Dutch East Indies, which was rich in oil, was invaded because they needed those natural resources that Japan itself did not have. So. Another question that around the Japanese internment. So when the Americans were interning the Japanese Americans, uh, Gabriel asked in the picture, was there an electric fence that surrounded the internment camps? No, there weren't any electric fences. Uh, they did have barbed wire fences and they had guard towers. And these guards were armed with, with weapons. 
but they place these internment camps way out in the areas where it wasn't populated. It was, a lot of places were just pretty much a desert. And, um, and so it would have made it extremely difficult if anybody attempted to escape from the internment camps to get away. And again, a lot of these people were mothers and children and they just didn't have the ability to, to do that. So um, they weren't electrified, but they did have barbed wire fences and guards. Thanks, Ford, for explaining that. Um, got a question from Ms. Francie. So, Eric, what would the impact have been if the U.S. didn't get involved in World War II? That's an interesting question, one of these what-if history types of things that I always love to answer. Um, uh, it, <laughs> this will probably be a little bit of a long answer to it, but uh, I believe that the U.S. didn't get involved in the war. Um, that Great Britain, the English, would have probably lost um, in Europe. Uh, they probably would have been pushed off the British Isles and probably moved their government system over to Canada, one of their uh, territories or colonial holdings uh, throughout history and fought the war from Canada, probably. Um, they were already stretched really thin. Uh, they were pushed out of France already. Uh, they were fighting in North Africa, the Middle East, and several of their Asia and Pacific uh, colonies. Uh, so the, the British were fighting all over the world at, at the outbreak of the war. And then um, Russia, um, they probably would have had to fight on two fronts against Germany, which they were fighting with. And then uh, Japan might have moved in as well and fought them, uh, made it a lot more difficult for them as well. Um, Italy, uh, on the Axis side, probably would have held more possessions in Africa. They already had a few colonies there. And, um, but in the end, I believe the U.S. would have probably uh, entered the war eventually. Um, probably not through the attack if that didn't happen, but probably maybe for financial reasons. Um, they have already extended a lot of credit and supplies and things to both Russia, China, and uh, the British. Um, so due to that, um, if those countries would have lost the war, the U.S. would have lost financially as well and would have been, the economy probably would have been destroyed at that time due to the fact that those payments wouldn't have come in and wouldn't have been able to keep up with that. So that could have been a reason why the U.S. entered the war as well if Pearl Harbor never happened. Uh, due to the fact that they were giving so much to these other countries um, and just to back themselves up and make sure that they would get those payments back uh, at the end of the war. Yeah. Yeah, so thanks, Eric. Ms. Francie asked a follow-on question to that is, did the Allies uh, ask the United States to join or did, was that the United States reaching out to provide help? Um, Ford, do you want to take that? It's kind of a the question again. Yeah. So did the allies uh, reach out and ask the United States to come and help? Um, I believe that uh, there was discussion between Prime Minister Churchill and uh, President Roosevelt about getting into the war. But uh, President Roosevelt was kind of had a problem because a majority of, of, of the American people believed in neutrality. They did not want to get into a war in Europe. Um, and uh, they, again, they recalled their experiences in World War I in Europe, and they didn't want a, a second experience of that. And so that's why neutrality was such a big thing at the time. And as the president, he had to respect the people's wishes and uh, that's why he had to maintain America as a neutral nation but at the same time providing lend-lease uh, to the allies but yeah that's basically the, the situation for uh, the United States at the time but was pleased by the allies for help and that's all that President Roosevelt could provide at the time. Thanks a lot, Ford. Now, we've only got a few more minutes left, and so I want to go and answer some of the questions um, people, the students were asking about the end of the war. 
So Kyle was asking, was there supposed to be a third bombing? Atomic bombing or? Mm -hmm. okay. um, or did they surrender before that would happen? They surrendered before that would have happened. Um, but also, um, everything that I've seen is there were thoughts or plans to possibly drop another one if they didn't surrender. But also at the same time, um, we didn't possibly didn't have a third bomb ready for it yet. Um, yeah, so there could have been plans for it, but we didn't have the equipment to do that third bomb. All right, thanks, Eric. So I think the final question is, is were the atomic bombs in internment camps too much of a retaliation and did those help the United States to accomplish our goals? Ford, do you want to take the internment question? Okay. Well, um, initially when uh, Executive Order 9066 was signed by President Roosevelt uh, interning the uh, uh, ja Japanese, uh, Americans of Japanese descent, um, they did have a fear that there might be espionage and spying done by um, these people. What's really confusing was the fact that um, the, the Germans of German defend, descent and Italian descent, they weren't rounded up and removed from their homes and placed in internment camps. Uh, so the, the sad part about what happened with the Japanese Americans was there was no, no due process of law. They're, they're, they were arbitrarily taken from their homes and placed in internment camps. And again, as I mentioned, there was no proof of espionage and spying by uh, Americans of Japanese descent, even though there were um, confirmed convictions of spying by uh, Americans of German descent. Okay. And for the question on were the atomic bombs um, too much of a retaliation and did they accomplish our goals? Um, at the point of the war when the, the two atomic bombs were used, um, the goal was to end the war as quickly as possible with the least amount of American lives lost. Um, so the use of these two bombs, yes, um, did accomplish that goal. Um, they brought the end. The war to an end and minimize the loss of American lives. Um, if they were not used, uh, the war could have gone on for several more years possibly. Um, and the U.S. at this point in the war, the U.S. had lost around 416 to 418,000 uh, soldiers and civilians through these four years um, of the of fighting. And if the U.S. had invaded mainland Japan, they had some estimations of possibly losing about a million American lives or more uh, in the invasion portion of this, not including the continued fighting after the invasion. Um, so uh, yes, the two atomic bombs, they did kill a lot of people when they were dropped. Um, but in the end, it also helped to save millions more lives in a war that had already taken over 50 million lives. Right. All right, thanks so much, Eric. We had a quick question from Bailey. What's behind you in that, that aircraft that's behind you? All right, so my couch is popping up. <laughs> All right, <laughs> so behind me is a, a model of a P-40 Warhawk hanging from the, the ceiling. Um, it's a U.S. Army fighter aircraft during World War II. And the map behind me is um, a map depicting the, the two attacking waves of Japanese aircraft on December 7, 1941. Oh, awesome. Thank you. So I think that we've run out of time for the questions, but you guys have had such thoughtful questions and it was so fun to get to interact with you through the chat and through your questions from your teacher. So we've really enjoyed it and really loved being a part of this um, learning time with you. So thank you so much for the opportunity to share and learn with all of you. Thank you. Aloha. All right, and uh, stay safe, everyone, and so hopefully you are all healthy and safe, and so are your families. So aloha from Hawaii.
Thank you, Ms. Francie. Bye. Thank you all so much. This is fantastic. Really appreciate it. Oh, we loved it. Aloha. Bye-bye. Aloha. Aloha.